This evening we have a rather involved situation, and therefore we had best explain as far as we can the difficulties in order that no false concepts develop as we proceed. The state of the study of atomism in ancient India is actually not clearly known. A number of factors have contributed to the dilemma. First, uh, we are dealing with a language uh, situation that is most complicated. And it is only possible for a few highly advanced Sanskrit scholars to really explore the depths of their own very complicated language. Up to now, this type of scholarship has been rare even in India. Uh, with the rise of the modern attitude toward knowledge, most Indian educators have definitely accepted or assumed the Western position. They are far more concerned with the advancement of modern scientific viewpoints than in digging into their own ancient literature. Perhaps it is the same as with many other things. Foreign beliefs have charm. Our own have become too familiar, and we pass over them lightly. The question arises then, is there any actual proof of the existence of an atomic theory in ancient India? By ancient we mean now the period, for instance, of the Veda or of the early Upanishads. Here again, it is doubtful if a half a dozen living Hindus have actually explored this literature thoroughly. It just rests waiting for better times. Up to 25 years ago, even the average Hindu scholar would have denied the probability of material relating to this field of inquiry in the very early Indian literature. But within the last 10 years, Certain doubts have arisen, and some Hindu writers have actually advanced the theory that atomism was known in the Vedic period, and that certain symbols, allegories, fables, legends, strange terms not easily translated or not even easily comprehended after the lapse of ages may well refer to this particular field of inquiry. In any event, I would say that now we have no true evidence uh, that the atomic theory was not known in ancient India. We have very little evidence that it was. We do, however, note a rising group of Orientalists who believe that there was a fairly well-integrated concept at a very early time. They base part of their opinion on early texts where certain passages could certainly be interpreted to suggest a knowledge of the atomic theory. And they base further uh, positive thinking upon another fact, namely, that about the beginning of the Christian era, atomism did appear in India. Now, where did it come from? The first thought might be that it reached Asia from Greece or North Africa, possibly through the campaigns of Alexander, which brought a great deal of Grecian culture to India, or even possibly as a result of isolated Greek philosophers who managed to reach India 
uh, probably shortly before the beginning of the Christian era or even earlier. When we study, however, the atomic theory as it develops in India, the idea that it was brought from Greece is rather inconvenient. In the first place, we might assume that if it did develop from certain traditions, philosophical or religious, which flourished among the Grecians, uh, that it would follow in general the thinking of the Greek states. This is not true. It does not follow very closely the outline which we went over in the first talk of this series last week, in which we did summarize, at least as best we could, uh, the basic thinking of the Greek philosophers of the 5th century B.C. The Indian thinking is essentially different. And if we are to assume that Indian philosophy did attain a comparatively high standing at an early date, it seems more probable that the atomic theory as it arose among the Hindus was a traditional descent from their own culture. That somewhere in early times, these foundations were laid. We know that there is a peculiar habit in the East Indian mind uh, it is a little like ours in this respect, perhaps, namely that there is very little recording of origination. The discoverers of things hardly get their names into permanent record. Some ancient Hindu who made a magnificent discovery is totally forgotten. These discoveries were not important to these people. Uh, that which was important was the gradual building up of tradition around a discovery. If a discovery stood for 500 years and a positive school arose to disseminate that, then the founder of the school and his followers received the publicity. The original author did not. This was a usual process. And as it generally required from three to five hundred years for an idea to develop a strong adherence in the mind of the thinkers, the coming of the atomic theory into public recognition in around the first century might well indicate that it had a background of three or four hundred years. One thing we do know in the early writings is that the Hindu was playing with what has been called the philosophy of infinitesimals. Now, that's an awful thing to call a philosophy, because some never outgrew that state, apparently. But at the same time, it is a curious and intriguing thought. The problem of smallness. The uh, mind of man has a tendency to take things apart. He finds out how they are made. And he also assumes uh, that the smallest conceivable things suggest further inconceivable degrees of smallness. It's the old story we've all heard before of what is smaller than the flea's mouth. And the inevitable answer is that which goes in at that mouth. There seems to be no possible answer except that. So whatever smallness we discover, seems to suggest a continual smallness, a continuance of reduction to an infinitesimal state. So the Vedas had already come to the conclusion, for example, that Atman, which is the universal being, the universal consciousness, should not be regarded alone as great and it is referred to as the smallness of the small. That actually we can honor a thing in two ways. By considering it so vast that it fills all space, or else considering it so small that it becomes the common denominator of all other things. This is a perhaps a strange way of looking at it, but the old Vedic thinkers certainly came to this conclusion. They therefore 
came to the natural belief that all things retire into continuing degrees of smallness until somewhere there is an utter or absolute smallness. Now, having gone this far, they are not too far from the concept of atoms, because they did recognize a unit of smallness, but they worked with it essentially from a religious point of view. So this unit of smallness became the spark of life. It became the infinitely small unit of eternity. And to meet the next question that naturally arose, our ancient Aryan forebears began to speculate with the concept of relativity. They were not without some rather serious thinking on this. They said to themselves, when we say smallness, what do we really mean? Do we mean something that is really small? Or do we merely mean something that is not so large as something else with which we compare it? Also, how shall we estimate the actual nature of smallness? How shall we determine whether we are small or large? How shall we try to determine in space the, con the concatenations of magnitude? It is quite conceivable, for example, that the solar system we live in and all that inhabits it may be regarded as only a gnat in some cosmic sunbeam. It, we don't know how small small is or how large large may be. Therefore, it is quite conceivable that infinite smallness is only a term and that we, could we consciously experience it, it would seem as great as what we call largeness. The Hindu would, of course, gone on to insist that the experience of Atman would be infinite greatness, and yet the body of Atman might be infinite smallness. The next point that uh, undoubtedly affected these old Aryans, because they were people of the earth, was the ever-present mystery of the seed. The seed growing in the ground. The mysterious productivity of the tiny seed which might come forth from the earth and manifest itself a hundred thousand times its own size. Therefore, a seed certainly is not as large as a tree. But a seed can grow to become a tree. And all things seem to grow from a smaller state. The plant grows from its seed into a complete plant. So that everywhere in the universe, the principle of the seed seemed to suggest itself to our primordial ancestors. To them, the idea seemed to be that the universe grew from a seed. They constantly emphasized this point. Now, if the universe grew from a seed, this seed might be very tiny. And yet, in the course of eternity, it might grow into a vast organism. Uh, certain of the early Hindu speculators, therefore, believed that space was filled with seed of all kinds and that worlds were constantly growing up in this mystery of space. And the lotus was the peculiar symbol of this because of the way in which it produces seed, drops them back into the water, they fall to the bottom, and then grow in their own right. Thus, the growth of a tiny seed into a great organism impressed them. And it came to their conviction that everything had a seed of some kind. They also began to contemplate what might happen if they assumed, for instance, that space was like Earth. And that in this Earth was an infinite number of seeds. 
Now, obviously and evidently, all these different seeds do not grow at once. Also, obviously, by some law, the seeds falling from plants and trees do not all grow. They fall into a soil that is capable of sustaining a certain number. Others are destroyed by the elements or by the birds of the air. Only a certain number of these seeds actually multiply and increase themselves. Others seem to die. We have the same thought in the New Testament of the seed that falls on sterile ground and the seed that falls on good soil. And this uh, concept led the ancient people always in the direction of the idea that things had their roots somewhere, that these roots came from seeds of some kind. We are not too far from some of this thinking even at the present time. And uh, these stratosphere balloon flights that were made some years ago seem to indicate that the outer atmosphere of the earth, far beyond that ramification in which men can live, that this outer atmosphere contains minute spores or kinds of seed cells floating in space and that these, when drawn within the atmosphere of some world or planet, would then perhaps explain how these globes originally came to be fruitful or to have life appear upon their surfaces. Certainly, if they were in a previously molten state, it would not be likely that the seeds of life could exist in such a state. Therefore, they must be conveyed afterwards and various concepts were developed to help to understand these various uh, problems. For well, they were very distinct problems in the thinking of ancient man. In India, uh, the atomic speculation uh, became more or less associated with what might be called the non-religious descent of thought. The religious systems uh, shied clear of it, particularly the early ones, uh, because they were essentially mystical, they were essentially non-scientific uh, in their essential attitude. To them, uh, science was merely a phase of a more important subject, the phase of religion. But India also produced, as did Greece and many other early nations, philosopher-scientists who even approached a rather definite degree of materialism in their thinking. There were both mystical and materialistic, materialistic schools of philosophy in India. The materialistic schools were the ones that began to play with the concept of atoms. And as a result of that, we do not find too much bearing upon it in the earlier religious literature. Now, India worked on the same problem the Greeks worked on, but they went about it just a little differently because they had a different basic theology to work with. In India, uh, the universal process of creation came as a result of a primary motion or being which these per, uh, scholars uh, accepted. This uh, being was one of the elder divinities of the Veda, or this motion was one of the great eternal impersonal principles of Yoga and Vedanta. In other words, the universe arose either from a deity or from a state of consciousness. And this state of consciousness, according to some schools, was later symbolized as a deity, but was essentially of itself a continuing state of creative consciousness. This consciousness actually existed in a continuing meditation. 
all things arose in this consciousness by yoga. All realities were inwardly envisioned by this consciousness itself. There were two views as to the uh, locale of this consciousness. According to one view, it was complete or total, inhabiting all space, filling it with a tremendous meditational, flowing, internal awareness. According to the other group, this consciousness was a center, a point, a, an area sunlight in the midst of space, radiating itself throughout space. These different scholars also uh, concerned themselves with the possible relationship of this consciousness to space per se. In other words, was this consciousness space? Or was this consciousness a primary being inhabiting space? Did space have an existence apart from this consciousness? Most of the schools took the attitude that there was an eternal fact, and that fact was space. Space was the vast stage upon which the drama of existence unfolded. What was space in reference for example, to consciousness. Obviously, to the Hindu mind, in spite of any effort uh, to rationalize the situation, space seemed to be greater even than consciousness. That is, it exceeded it. For that which holds all things must be greater than anything that it can hold. And it must also be greater than the sum of all that it contains. Therefore, space becomes an absolute infinite. Consciousness becomes something a little different from that. So it led these early people to speculate concerning the relationship between space, we will say, and immortality. Consciousness could conceivably be immortal. Space could conceivably be eternal. Therefore, an immortal being inhabiting an internal space seemed to sort of tie the package up rather neatly. But there were other questions, and even the ancient peoples were not afraid to ask them. They were more inquiring in many things than we are. So they naturally ask the question, if consciousness is immortal, then we are dealing with something that has an always existence. And if space is eternal, we are dealing with another factor, with an endless or timeless duration. And we come finally to the same essential point in this that the Greeks came to, that it was necessary to postulate two almost equal eternal factors. The Greeks at one time referred to these as ether and chaos, declaring therefore that agent and patient, or the worker and the thing worked upon, both had to have an eternal existence so that the job went on forever. This, uh, to a measure, ended a lot of argument. And it was a lot of argument that we have never been able to terminate ourselves in Western thinking, because we have been rather slow to accept the eternity of consciousness, and for that matter, the eternity of space. But if we finally differentiate between these two enduring things. We are differentiating between two abstract factors. We are dealing with an absolute consciousness which we cannot define, and an absolute space which we cannot define. We are also dealing with, again, this problem of previous existence. 
was this eternal consciousness at any time different from the way it is now? Did it come somewhere or did it come from somewhere? Has this consciousness always inhabited the same distribution of space? Has it always had the same space allotment? To the uh, East Indian thinker, uh, this type of question suggested another point, namely that consciousness itself, having an eternal subsistence, uh, coeval with space itself, that consciousness passed through conditions, but that these conditions in no way basically affected its relationship with space. In other words, creation to the Hindu was a periodic phenomenon. Creation was an objectification of consciousness. Uh, the disintegration of worlds, the final uh, resolving of creation into chaos was simply a gradual retiring of consciousness from an objective to a subjective state. Thus to the Hindu thinking, the principle of consciousness had within it a certain tidal rhythm, a principle of patterned motion. And this motion of consciousness was not from place to place, but from state to state. Therefore, it was a kind of a fourth dimensional motion. Thus, consciousness did not grow up. Consciousness, however, did have a rhythm in its own eternity. And like the tides of a great ocean, Consciousness ebbed and flowed within the infinite area of space. And this ebbing and flowing resulted in the appearance and disappearance of creations. And this ebbing and flowing, which was the inhaling and exhaling of Brahma, corresponded in the meditation school to the internalization and externalization of consciousness. Thus the Supreme Being, meditating upon creation, caused this creation to exist as a thought within its own nature. This Being, having exhausted the meditation upon creation, having carried creation from its infinite beginning to its infinite end, ceased its meditation upon creation and immediately the illusion of the world ceased. Now the next natural problem that would arise from this is the nature of the consciousness which abides in space. How shall we understand its essential nature? Of what, of what is it composed? How is it fashioned? Of what is it made? And to the ancient particularly the scientific atomists. This consciousness was, in the early atomic schools of India, regarded as atomic. Therefore, deity is actually uh, an atom. An atom of incredible and inconceivable power. When this atom retires into itself, it becomes the immeasurably small. When it emerges from itself, it becomes the inconceivably great. But the moment that it, that it ceases to press itself outward into manifestation, it gradually retires again into itself. And in retiring into itself, it seems to retire into the infinitely small, becoming a seed less than a seed. Now the parallel to this uh, would be found in certain of the Vedanta concepts, and therefore 
uh, we can do something with them. Let us now think in terms of consciousness meditation itself. The individual entering into the state of meditation or into the state of deeper insight experiences the gradual enlargement of internal until this in internal consumes him. And in the state of samadhi, this internal has become infinite. And by means of it, the individual identifies the experience of infinites in his own nature. As a being, he has ceased. In samadhi, his objectivity has ceased and he stands upon the very brink of the extinction of consciousness itself. Yet approaching this, even this brink, he experiences a kind of mystical unfolding of himself. As one mystic expressed it, he suddenly beholds the universe within him instead of being within the universe. Thus, by means of the meditative discipline, the subjective or internal life expands until it becomes more vast than the world. And no boundaries of time or space as we know them can contain it. And it threatens momentarily to burst through into total universality. Then if the mood is changed and gradually the meditating uh, devotee begins to reintegrate upon the objective plane. This vastness of the internal diminishes until finally objectivity as we know it with its illusional uh, sensory types of perception uh, close over this internal experience. And this tremendous power in man retires again to become the infinitely small. For in the average person, his own spiritual equation is infinitely small. It is so small that he cannot even find it. Yet under certain moods it expands. Under certain other moods it contracts. But in the maximum of his objective awareness, uh, the internal or subjective awareness becomes merely a seed again, a tiny unit capable of an infinite manifestation. Thus the uh, thinker in India, conceiving of the Atman atom, or conceiving uh, of the eternal principle of all things as an atom, bestowed upon this atom an infinite vitality, an incredible absolute potential, and then conceived the unfolding of this potential into a potency or power. Let us try to understand this just a little bit by another type of analogy. Some of you have probably seen motion pictures of the blossoming of flowers in which the speed of the camera was reduced so that you could actually see the flower open slowly. The camera uh, was so set uh, that you saw in a few minutes processes that perhaps required several days. This slow unfolding uh, will give you a concept of exactly uh, the type of opening up uh, that the ancient uh, thinker assigned to the idea of his spark, his tiny flame, his minute point, which uh, derived from the Hindu religion was taken over by the scientific group to form the basis of the atomic concept. Now presume for a moment that a tiny spot of life, infinitely small, uh, received into itself the quickening power of destiny. The time for it to awaken came. Now this awakening we think of 
as an awaking into objectivity alone. But in the Eastern mind, this awakening was merely the unfolding of the seed of meditation within the consciousness of this principle. The infinitely small, then, began to unfold, and uh, wonder upon wonders, it released in great cycles or waves from within itself, like circles of petals, opening in groups or singly. It gradually unfolded its own potential. It brought forth from itself suns, moons, and stars. It brought forth from itself constellations and galaxies. It then further brought out from its own nature planets. And as these planets in turn, by this slow motion, began to unfold their own internal potentials, these planets began to bear life. Life in turn began to grow and unfold its own potential. And finally, every form of life, conceivable and inconceivable, manifested as a chain reaction, waking up out of this central sleep and touched by this motion or by this awareness of internal consciousness of the atom itself, unfolded its own potential. And out of each of the creatures that was released in this way, came forth more seeds, for the human body is a mass of these seeds, in each one of which is an infinite capacity to enlarge or increase or manifest, until finally from this one atom there burst forth the entire cosmos. And this cosmos was nothing more or less than the unfoldment of the immense potential of the atom. And having exhausted its unfoldment, the same thing happens that happens to the plant, which having brought forth its fruit, proceeds to wither and die. By degrees, all of these innumerable manifestations fall away into space. And in space, they are broken down again into their various component units. And these units return to the infinite reservoir of space. But the consciousness, the life, the meditation of the meditating being is withdrawn from these forms one by one until at last the flower seems to close again. And from its own closing to return into its stems and into its roots and finally once more into its seed. The walls of the seed seemed to close around it, and where there was once an infinite manifestation, there is once again only a tiny germ floating in the mystery of space. Now this is a pretty big thought, you know, when we get working on it. And it has some interesting possibilities. But it does point out very largely an analogy derived from the observation of the natural forms of growth. It, however, does give us something that perhaps is a little bit consistent with modern thinking. It suddenly reveals to us the incredible power that is locked within this minute seed-like thing. Now, this atom of the Hindu speculation is probably not just the atom which attracted the attention of Professor Einstein, but it still does carry this wonderful thinking, namely that from every unit of space may emerge a total creation, extending throughout time and space, being simply the release of the consciousness energy of the atom, and that this consciousness energy is released by a form of meditation, an inward enlargement of existence. That through this, therefore, creation is no longer regarded as a valid material world, 
but as a dream existing within the heart and mind of an eternal dreamer. Now, the poetic phase of this was also quite natural to the Oriental mind. About this time, the sect of the Jains took over this particular field of his speculation and began to work with a kind of atomic theory that is a little closer to the Greek schools, but also has its differences. To the Jains, for example, uh, there were only two existing things, space and these units of life called atoms. The, uh, these two operating upon each other produced existence. But in order to explain their problem in a little more reasonable way, uh, the Jains had to establish somewhat different quality within the atom itself, and that recognized by the Greek. For example, in the Jain philosophy, uh, there was no longer just one kind of atom. Uh, the Greeks had this basic concept that everything was built from the same material. The Jains, following the essential philosophy of Hinduism, recognized the possibility and the probability that atoms, or these infinitely small particles, were of four basic types. Your Hindu ancient, uh, along with some other people, particularly the uh, Greco-Egyptian culture group, held the reality of four elements. They said that the world was created out of the combinations of four elemental substances, or which they called earth, water, fire, and air. Later, the medieval European philosophers sort of improved it a little bit. They declared that the universe was composed also of these four elements, but they called them carbon, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. But they still had four elements. Now, the Hindus had a fifth element, but the fifth element, Akasha, uh, was a kind of permeating essence. The fifth element really was not a true element. It was a kind of spiritual mist that was associated with life processes. Uh, the Hindus had essentially four elements. So when the Jains began to speculate with their atomic theory, they came to the conclusion that there were four basic kinds of elements and four basic kinds of atoms. Therefore, the, there was the earth or physical substance atom, the water atom, the fire atom, and as they called it, the wind atom. For to them, air in motion had to be something in motion. It could not be nothing in motion. It had to have a, a structure, a substance. Out of the four kinds of atoms, therefore, all forms were built up. Uh, to these people, atoms also had more uh, definite shape qualities uh, than among the Greeks. Uh, the Jains recognized several shapes of atoms, and they recognized in the rudimentary power of atoms the rudiment of color, the rudiment of sound, which later goes into the ragas of Indian music, uh, the rudiment of flavor, the rudiment of odor, and various rudimentary principles. Therefore, when a group of atoms built up a form, this form not only had a body, but an odor. It not only had an odor, but it had a sound or a tone equivalent, a thinking much, much, much like that of Pythagoras. Uh, it also was true that these forms built up out of atoms had flavors as an apple, which has a form, it has a color, 
you can taste it, and it has an odor that is peculiar to apples. To, to assure these propensities within things, the Jains held that the rudimentary substances from which these things were composed must also have these attributes. But these attributes were too minute in the atom itself to be discernible. Therefore, the atom contained the potential of certain characteristics and qualities, and they also laid down a principle that was later to be taken over by the Buddhistic atomists, who did their own peculiar little trick with it. But for the present moment, uh, it is enough to simply say that each group of atoms had to create a response in the sensory areas or the skandhas in man, and that the only way in which a quality or attribute could be conveyed from the outer world through the sensory perceptions to the brain of man was that, the, that this form or this nature had to have an energy or a vital archetypal existence. In other words, it had to be something that could convey its own qualities to the individual. Now, in certain things, such as odor, we observe that this quality radiates from the object so that it may be uh, sensed uh, at a considerable distance, uh, whereas some of the other perceptions must approach it more immediately. So the uh, Jains also went on to say that uh, these minute units, which were atoms, were as units and atoms indivisible, but that any two atoms essentially dissimilar could unite, forming in space a vast number of pairs, uh, that the natural tendency of atoms was to unite but that this union was always according to opposing qualities. And it wasn't long, of course, before you could get into the concept of your sympathetic and antipathetical elements. For instance, a fire atom and a water atom would mingle because they were opposites. An earth atom and an air atom would mingle because they are opposites. Whereas certain other compounds would be indifferent of each other therefore would not naturally mingle. But on the ground that we all notice, particularly in matrimony, that opposites attract each other, and sometimes never cease to be opposites, this particular attitude resulted atomically in the creation of dual atoms. Now the dual atom, like the single atom, remains invisible. The next act in the development of them is that these dual atoms form together into triads, a triad consisting of three pairs of atoms. The moment three pairs of atoms unite to form a triad, what is to the giant thinking a conceivable form emerges into existence. In other words, the most minute thing that the human being can see is a unit of these six atomic uh, structures. Now, the ability to see these, however, uh, was also uh, rather carefully analyzed by these uh, ancient ones. And they came to the conclusion that without a certain internal extrasensory power, this compound still remained invisible. But that it was conceivable that it could be seen. Now this meant that at a very early stage in their thinking, the Jains began to conceive that from the combinations of compounds, various forms could be built. 
in themselves compound beings. Thus, in the Jain philosophy, you were some way sort of escape from one of the dilemmas of the Greeks, namely that all different things come entirely from the same thing, and the difference lies only in arrangement or number. The Jains say no, that the arrangement also includes quality, that there are therefore these four kinds of atomic structures, and that uh, as they proceed, after you, for instance, you get a group of six forming this triunity, which forms the next important unit. This unit also, by its chemistry, becomes a unit, a total unit again, a one, with a predom predominant or pervading nature. This unit, in turn, must attract its own unit opposite from the field of potential, and it draws to itself another group of six which have become a unit. And this process goes on. And in the course of building up this chemistry, the problem of similar and dissimilar is met by the fact that gradually, the composition of the as accumulating structure uh, by the law of opposites ultimately becomes so complicated that it can draw all of the four elements into itself in some cases. In other cases, it does not do so. For example, to the giant, for instance, the element of water, all of the oceans, rivers, seas, and rains of the earth, are the result of the gradually building up of only a small group of units. The fire-water combination alone infinitely multiplying itself. In the case of the element of fire, which seems to be the, the same general polarity, but represents the opposite group. Also, your fire-water groups have to form the element of fire. But in the course of time, or in the course of the infinite mingling and blending of these atomic structures, one has come to dominate the other. If humidity dominates, the element remains water. If heat begins to dominate, it dries up the water, and you have fire. Now, uh, all of the simple elements that we know are therefore composed of the most simple compounds. The most complex pattern we know is man himself. And in his nature, all of the elemental principles have become involved. And in the building up of his atomic structure, a whole group of atoms have been brought in to form various structures, organs, uh, and various tissues, all of them, however, built gradually from the accumulating of these units of six until finally the whole compound is assembled. Now the Jains go a little further and they take on the concept that when these atoms form these various patterns, that these atoms in a mysterious way seem to be ensouled by a connective or a power that radiates from themselves, or not necessarily radiates, it um, emerges from themselves. Now, for instance, if you have a set of six of these three pairs making a unit, you have not only an outer unit of the six, but you have a kind of inner unit, because to these, to this unity of the six atomic forms is added a series of subtle unities of qualities within these forms with the result that the akasha, or fifth element, is released. Because the a fifth element is a principle which is a binder in all of them. 
And it is this binder which is always released whenever a set of six atoms unite. And from this binder emerges that part of man uh, which is not body, but which has no uh, tangible existence apart from body. For from the Akasha principle is gradually unfolded the internal psychic life of the individual. The soul, therefore, has a certain existence in the more subtle phases of the atom. Now let's try and explain that a little more simply. The form of the atom, uniting, creates structure. But the atom also has a flavor. It has a color. It has a sound. It has a scent emanating from it. Therefore, these other qualities, which are not directly involved in the physical structure that is built up, result in the building up of a sensory structure which is capable of perceiving these attributes because it is essentially composed of them. Thus the atom has within it what you might broadly term a psychic nature which also combines to form a composite psychic entity at the same time that it forms a physical unit. This building up of continual psychic entity through all these compounds in which perhaps ultimately billions of these atoms unite, all this time the psychic compound is also building up from this union so that your form becomes an external body and an internal integration of qualities. At any given time, this internal integration of qualities bestows characteristic, uh, bestows temperament, uh, bestows emotional quality, anything uh, that is not pertaining to the form itself. Now this unit that is built up to the Hindus, for example, the primary units were not perhaps what we call molecules, but they were, might be a little like them. So we have another uh, giant concept, namely that the atom is to the molecule what the soul is to the body in man. That, uh, that always the minute particles carry the overtone or the upper part of things or the upper qualities of things. And always the units which compose consciousness are finer or smaller than the units which compose matter. And a certain number of matter units forming a pattern release the smaller element units which are contained within the atomic structure. And this gives the giant another definition, namely that while an atom theoretically cannot be destroyed, the atom can and does have parts. Now this is what the Greeks were not so sure of. They didn't like to think that the atom had parts. They thought it was indivisible. The giant said, yes, it is indivisible, but it does have parts. These parts exist within it, but cannot be divided from it. But these parts in the aggregations of atoms also exercise their own aggregate qualities.